Am I am I hosting? Am I opening? We <laughs> <laughs> talk about who was going to be opening. <laughs> okay, I'll just I'll just go with it. Hey guys, let's just all talk together and say <laughs> welcome. Who's the <laughs> <host? laughs> Welcome to the shit show, guys. <laughs> Welcome. Maybe we should have decided who was hosting it before we all hit record. But anyway, <laughs> here we are. Of course, my name is Bryce. I'm from Esoteric Atlanta. And I'm joined with my co host today, Emmy and Stephanie. You guys very much know who these ladies are. And of course, all my channel links to their channels will be down in the description box below. I'm going to try to keep this YouTube appropriate, even though I'm posting all my videos both on Rumble and YouTube right now. I would suggest, again, FYI, before we get to the subject at hand, I have been told, and I think this is safe for me to share it, if you, if you are a content creator, you don't have a Rumble channel, please go ahead and create a Rumble channel, okay? Um, there might come a... I don't know when this is going to be. I have no idea of timelines, but um, I don't know how long this particular platform will be as it is. So go ahead and get familiar with Rumble, guys. Um, we're, we're, I'm going to be pro hopefully posting this video on both Rumble and YouTube. Hopefully, we'll keep this YouTube friendly. So how are you ladies today? I'm exhausted. <laughs> If you want to know my honest feelings right now, I just did my first hour workout in a couple of weeks. I was doing a half an hour to 45 minutes because I got a little bit lazy for the last couple of weeks due to other stuff going on. So, but other than that, I feel kick ass. <laughs> like I kicked some butt. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Emmy? How's it going over, over in your neck of the woods? Oh, we're, we're trying to uh, fall into a routine, getting going with homeschool. And I have very strong-willed children who don't want to <laughs> do anything. So it's been exhausting mentally, just trying to get them into a routine. But we're coming along. <laughs> we're coming along. They're like, this is not where we came to earth, mom. We did not come to earth. <laughs> well, I mean... I've shifted what I've been teaching them, actually. Um, I have incorporated uh, spirituality and spiritual growth into it, meditation. Right now, my seven-year-old is absolutely fascinated with the pyramids. And I was able to find these really old books from the 70s and 80s. The library was selling them for a dollar a piece. And I've got like 10 really old hardcover books about mythology and the pyramids and monolithic structures and all this stuff. And he is just, he, he even takes his little magnifying glass that we bought to look at fossils. He takes it through the pictures that have the picture stories on it and he'll look at it. He's like, mom, look at this. What do you think that is? And it's like, yes. he's remembering a past life or he built those. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe he's obsessed with the Titanic too. And I presented him with, uh, another version of why it may have sank. And I'm like, what do you think? Do you think it was, do you think it struck an iceberg or do you think this other thing? And he's like, I think they, I think they sunk it on purpose. I'm like, he's seven. He's seven it guys. Sense, right. It's like, what is it? I'm sorry, guys. Every time I'm in Atlanta, my nose runs like crazy. I think it's because I'm around a lot. Every of time you're in Atlanta. <laughs> well, it got better in Connecticut. <laughs> there, it got better in Connecticut, but I think it's because I'm around a lot of this. My nose has just been pouring. But anyway, I apologize for that. But you know, it's funny. Um, I'm actually, so in the law of one, they talk a lot about the pyramids in the law of one. And I am, trying really hard. I haven't even told you guys, I'm trying really hard to get someone I know who is like really smart when it comes to law of one to come on and do an episode with us over all the details of the law of one, because in my opinion, our friend Natalie is reading it on her channel. Um, in my opinion, your, your kids might enjoy some of that. I mean, they might be a little young for it, but they might enjoy some of the perspectives because the law of one really is like a scientific outlook on spirituality and it can be incorporated into any faith you know, because it's all about polarity. It's all about what we're going through, which is kind of what we were going to, and they, they do talk about, they talk about the pyramids a lot. From what I understand, basically the, the, the entity, the group that's being channeled in the law of one says that they came down to earth to teach people through shapes and ended up backfiring. Um, and so they call themselves the brothers and sisters of sorrow because they're like, oops, we didn't mean to do that. 
And so they're trying to help us move into this new density. So I am really, and, and everything they talk about just makes so much sense with how we're moving up in densities, the polarization of negative to positive, all that kind of stuff. And it does absolutely marry into the yoga philosophy, which we're going to talk a little bit about today with the Shiva Shakti, what is Prakriti, what is Purusha, and within the shadow work, um, some mis, uh, misconceptions that uh, we've been talking off camera about that we see a lot in this, the, you know, a lot of times in this truther community, not only everybody should do themselves a favor and make a friend who's been awake for like 20 years, because they are the people that are going to keep you on track because they've seen it all. And when people are newly awakened to, to truth, sometimes they go a little bit delusional and they go a little bit in the opposite direction of where they need to go. And we're seeing it now heavily within the spiritual side of the great awakening, which is what I'm mostly interested in. That's my job outside of this is spirituality. That's to me, the crux of what's going on right now. And, um, and so we were going to talk about again, about the shadow work. We've already talked about this one in one episode, and we're going to talk about it again and what that looks like along with spiritual hygiene and what spiritual hygiene actually really, really, really looks like. Um, there's no, uh, get enlightened easy card. There's no easy, no one's going to do it for you. Um, that's not the point of being a human being, which we'll talk about in, in great detail coming up. But where do you ladies want to start with this? Uh, um, okay, so I'll just say this uh, off the bat. Um, in the Law of One, in session 93 and in session 66, they talk about consciously working through catalysts. And a catalyst is any life experience that causes any kind of discomfort, whether it be a small irritation to a huge trigger. Any life lesson is a catalyst. And if you're not consciously and intentionally working through these catalysts on paper, not just thinking about it and mulling it over in your head, but writing it down, talking to others, um, you know, doing um, specific um, spiritual routines, or, you know, if you're not consciously and intentionally working through these life catalysts, they're not being learned. And they're going to come around again, and they're going to come around again, and they're going to come around again until you learn them. Mm -hmm. So if you're not taking the time to work through your resentments, um, there is a, a spiritual teacher named Aaron Abke. He follows Law of One. He follows A Course in Miracles. He has excellent videos excellent, excellent videos on how to work through a catalyst. I started a catalyst journal myself and it has been absolutely mind blowing. I've only been doing it for two months. I have so much stuff has come up and uh, also forgiveness. Forgiveness is absolutely key. You have to start with yourself because unless you, unless you can forgive yourself, you don't really understand what the point is or how to do it for someone else. It's like you have to see yourself the way God sees you first, and then you can see others that way. And it's just so important to work through it consciously and intentionally. Like Law of One says, if you're, if you're just imagining or thinking about it, it's, it's, it's going to end up filtering through the mind and end up in the body, in the physical body somewhere as an ailment, an injury, an illness, some kind of disease, some kind of cancer. It will always manifest in the physical and that's the last place it will manifest is in the physical and that again mirrors the yoga teaching too about friction we talk about friction is necessary a catalyst a tower moment triggers these are necessary for you to understand yourself so that very much mirrors the yoga teaching as well um the, the deep that it's thousands of years old and um you know, we've talked about that a lot, Stephanie, too. And I like that you, you know, when we talk about it coming into the body, that's why physical exercise is such an incredible way to work through those. You know, we've been, especially in the Western world, we think of exercise as being almost like a punishment to, to fit into skinny jeans. But if you, if you change your perspective and you actually get into your body and you feel the energy starting to move and you feel where the energy is stuck, you know, the hips are a big one. The shoulders are a big one. I carry tension in the back of my neck. You can feel it. You can start to move that energy through. And what happens sometimes in exercise, that energy that, that, that becomes unstuck all of a sudden presents itself. And so it might present itself as tears, as laughter, sure. 
as anxiety. And sometimes it's not necessarily, as we say in yoga, it's not, it's not necessary to remember what caused that energy because you're just working with the sensation of energy to heal through it. And once you have a particular amount of stuck energy, it's going to attract even more stuck energy that resembles it because the universe wants you to work through it. They're like, look at this, look at this, look at this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's kind of the, the, the goal of the body is the GPS system. That's if you have a body, then your work is never, as long as you're in body, you're going to have things to work on. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. never going to be done. We can have spiritualists that are, that are telling people right now in our community, you know, whether it be on Twitter or Telegram or YouTube, oh, you have no ego. You're, you've done the work. And if you're getting that from a spiritualist, they're a fraud and that they don't know what they're talking about. No. And, and that's been I happening. Not only will I not go to somebody who is like, I will not go to a healer that's not actively working on themselves, but I also won't go to a healer that hasn't done the, the studies for themselves, who hasn't studied this stuff, you know, and you, our friend Cindy talks about the Shiva Shakti, like, so the Shiva is the soul, the Shakti is the expression of the soul. So in the Yoga Sutras, <laughs> why? why is that Shiva Shakti? So in the Yoga Sutras, it talks about Purusha Prakriti, it's the same thing. Purusha is the soul, Prakriti is the nature, the expression of the soul, right? We, in the Yoga Sutras, it talks about how we created as souls, we created this experience in order to know ourselves, in order to realize who we really are. And so even when we, a lot of people are under this delusional thinking that when we ascend to fourth density positive, that all of a sudden we're not going to have work to do. That's not true. Even the law of one covers this, like every dimension, you, you just have more, you have different things to work through. It's just going to look different. But the beautiful thing about third density is the polarity. Yeah. It's the polarity. Without the contrast, we wouldn't be able to know who we are. It's like, it's like trying to see yourself, trying to look at yourself through your own eyeballs. Yeah. You, can't, you can't. You need a yeah. mirror. You need a mirror to show you who you are without this contrast of up, down, right, left, bad, good. Without the contrast, there's no way for us to know who we are or what we need to work on or what we need to heal from or grow into. It's, you can't see perfection from perfection. You have to have contrast. It's mm -hmm. just, that's, that's, now, that's what Alan Watts says too. He's a great one. He talks about, it's like the eyeball trying to see itself. And Alan Watts once was asked, um, what's the point of life? And Alan Watts said, the point of life is to be alive. And what mm -hmm. he meant by that was to ex actually experience everything, the pain, the sorrow. I've told this story so many times and I want to say it again. My original teacher, David Garig, when he asked Guruji in India, Guruji, this, this practice is painful. Is that necessary? And Guruji said, yes, yes because pain is real. It's real. And that's where we come to that place of honesty within ourselves. It's like sometimes in the yoga practice, when you have an injury, it's the best place to be. Because when you come to the yoga mat with an injury you're working through, you're coming to the mat in a, a real place of honesty. Mm -hmm. There's a, you have to really be within that moment and really be in yourself descending. We talked about that with Cindy. You have to descend in spirituality. Isn't about wearing a bunch of mala beads, saying certain words and pulling tarot cards, which Stephanie can we'll talk about this more. Spirituality is about descending into yourself. It's mm -hmm. taking the tarot cards away. It's taking the pendulums away. It's taking all the distracting things away and really being in yourself. Who are you? And we were talking when Stephanie went to the restroom earlier, you know, people get, we were talking about all this stuff about, you know, who am I in this new world, all this kind of stuff. Well, all these things are just labels. That's all they are. So for me as Bryce in this life, I'm a white girl, blonde hair, blue eyed, who was born in the Southeast. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I have a sister. I have nieces and nephews. I have a YouTube channel, but that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. that's just the expression of my experience here in this life. Who am I? So in order for you to start to work on who you are, you have to take all that away. You have to take away, if you're a mother, both of you are mothers, what if you take away that away? I'm not a mother anymore. I'm not a wife anymore. I'm not a girlfriend anymore. I'm not a sister anymore. I'm not white. I'm not black. I'm not Asian anymore. Who am I then? 
And a lot of people get very scared of that because all of a sudden, everything we've, we've worked for, if you take away the degrees, you take away the experiences. We're programmed to have labels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're programmed to want to be up here. When really, in order to get up here, we have to come down here. Mm-hmm. And we, we, I think so many people, many star seeds, many empaths, many whoever, light workers, have been so suppressed of living what others would conceive as a normal life that they enter this great awakening and they look at it like, Oh my gosh, I was this in a past life. I'm this now. And, and then again, they're putting the labels back on themselves and, and to, to feel important and everything. And I, and I get that. And I understand that, that concept because I was suppressed of a lot of things also in my life, but we also need to remember that the soul is none of those things, right? Like you just said, what is the soul? And so we really have to take a step back in because when we get to that point where we're just, we're holding on to those things, we start to get delusional. We start to lose concept of what's really truly important in this lifetime and what we're, why did our souls choose to live out the experiences we're living out right now? Right? Exactly. And I, and I will say I had my first pendulum class last night and I was so proud because there was a couple of uh, women in there who said, well, we've been doing the bar classes. And I'm like, I almost nearly cried and crapped myself at the same time <laughs> because like, I was just so excited for them because I'm like, you guys get it. You get it. Like, because one of the things I went over with um, everyone that came to the class last night was how important it is to ground yourself when you are using divination because it is only a tool really to exercise your intuition. And I said to them, the goal is not to use a pendulum. The goal is, you know, the pendulum is good for, it's like muscle testing, right? Is this like Tamara has said on um, your channel, Bryce, she uses it to figure out what supplements she needs in the morning. It isn't for gossip purposes. Same thing with the cards. Same thing with, I started divinating with runes recently, which is really cool by the way. But at the same time, I would be a very irresponsible channeler if I was not incorporating any kind of shadow work or exercise and stuff like that. And I actually channel so much better when I do the work on myself. Um, And you can tell when somebody is not doing their work. You can definitely tell. And I think it's really important to start doing all this work because there's a lot of delusional thinking going on right now. A lot. It's getting really bad. Can we talk about Can we pause in the past life thing for a minute? Because I want to really talk about this Mm -hmm. Um, past. I believe absolutely 100% in past lives. Mm -hmm. Um, This is an almost in every single spiritual discipline, even yes, Christians, even Yashua talked about past life experiences in the missing books of the Bible. Energy (laughs) cannot be destroyed or created. It can only keep going. And the law of one does speak about this, where you actually plan out your life, your next life, according to what lessons that you still need to learn, right? Now, past lives are interesting in a scientific exploration only. I know who I was in some of my past lives. I've had memories and I've had to heal some of that trauma from those memories. However, I'm not those people right now. Right now, my name is Bryce. And I want to be called Bryce because that's the life I'm in right now in this timeline. Yes, we're going to, I know that the three of us have probably lived multiple lives together, but right now we're Stephanie, Emmy, Emmy, and Bryce. You could have someone in your life that was your lover in a past life, but is just your business partner in this life. That's an agreement your soul's made. And what happens when people are so focused on past lives is that they're escaping this life. Yeah. Whenever I meet somebody who's so focused on a past life, I want to be like, and what about you now? Because the person you are now is the course you're working on and is the one that's interesting to me is who you are right now. And there's a show that I watch at night sometimes just to relax. It's called the dead files. And it's this, um, 
New York homicide detective and a medium that go into these houses. It's very interesting. I always laugh at their scratches because you ain't seen nothing until you've seen the scratches that I've gotten from spirits. But, um, but anyway, there was one interesting episode where this family had bought this hotel and they were, and the mother of the family was like intoxicated by the hotel. She couldn't let it go. And the medium it was the one time I've heard her in this whole series say to this woman, you feel called here because of a past life, but you have to leave. You have to leave. This will kill you. You're not in that life right now. You're in this life now. You need to leave this place. You need to sell this hotel. You cannot stay here. You have to fight that. And I want, I really wish I could just like send that, that episode out to everyone to be like, Focusing so much on past lives is such, first of all, it's an escapism from your work in this life, and it's going to cause delusional thinking. It's going to cause things that are not for your highest good. You need to be here now in this moment because your soul, the same soul that created that past life for you, also created this existence for you too with equal acceptance. Mm -hmm. So what are you avoiding? In this life, if you're so focused on that, what is and it, it can happen to the most spiritual person too? I mean, let's just touch on that for a second. I mean, we can all get caught up in that stuff because of the, you know, maybe feeling like we were nothing in this lifetime. I think it, I think it comes down to childhood wounds. I think it comes down to um, just the programming that we're trying to break out of and, and wanting to just feel accepted and feeling like we're somebody who is seriously important and everything. But the fact of the matter is all of us are important in our own individual jobs and our own individual purposes. We all have a job to do. We all have many, many purposes to fulfill. Um, but if we're focusing so much on that, we're not going to see the bigger picture in this lifetime. We're not going to see what, so what is my really important mission to do on in this lifetime? What do I have to work on in this lifetime? Because again, it's just an experience, right? And that's, that's an important thing you just hit on. So if we, if we feel powerless in this life, but we know we were someone powerful in a past life. So we're trying to borrow that sensation from an existence already passed. What does that tell you? No, you need to find your power in this life because mm -hmm. you're the same soul. And that comes down to the chakra system as well. Like that's, that's so the, the aura. that's the third chakra. And, and that those chakras are, are great and and you guys you can't i just want to clarify too if you're going to someone to heal your chakras they need to know actually know what your chakras are okay each chakra has their i know emmy's highly educated in this because of reiki they each have their own symbols their own colors their own sanskrit names their own purposes you can't stop your chakra you cannot remove your chakra your chakra is either going to whichever one is imbalanced it's most probably most of them are if not all of them for everyone is a little off that's being human is either spinning too fast or it's spinning too slow. And that's where we try to figure out where the overactivation is or the underactivation is. And so I don't know if you guys want to talk more about that because we're seeing a lot of, um, well, first of all, a lot of people are really focused on the third eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's very, very dangerous. And I mean, I've seen that actively. I've actively seen people just constantly third eye, third eye, third eye, third eye, third eye. Okay, so what's going on with your root? You know, are you stable? Are you rooted in, you know, to earth? Are you grounding yourself? You know, um, how's your relationship with your dad? Do you have problems with men if you're a female? You know, stuff like that. You know, and then you're looking at the other chakras. Like, I, I find that the first three chakras and females especially have been heavily attacked um, you know, especially like where the womb is, because that's the chalice, that's the grail, right? So I mean, before you can really start to really dive into using your your third eye, you know, it's it's so important to ground yourself. I mean, if I was divinating and doing readings on people and not doing that, that's that would be irresponsible of me. Um, and again, it goes into and in, I'm reading um Eastern body, Western mind on my channel, because the thing is when we're not doing that work and we're just all about the third eye, you are going to send yourself into the loony bin. Absolutely. You really are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I say something about, okay. So what I'm noticing is that really what needs to be worked on the most are the first three chakras, because 
The root is all about lack, scarcity mindset. The sacral chakra is about attachments. The um, solar plexus is about control. And those are all beliefs of the ego that are false. You know, I have control. Outcomes bring me uh, happiness. And I'm not enough. Those are the three main problems plaguing everyone and, you know, all of their variations. If we can unblock and work through all of the lack, all of the attachments, all of the judgments, all of the control issues, then the energy from below will have a free flow to meet the energy coming down from above in the heart space. Because what happens is when somebody says, oh, I think I have a blockage in my heart space. The heart space can't process judgment. It has to be done down here. So the heart will feel like it's being closed off because it can't process a judgment. <laughs> Sorry, guys. There you go. She's a mama. <laughs> um, so that kind of stuff can't be processed in the upper chakras. It has to be done in the lowers. And if if that's being avoided because you don't want to do the work or you're scared or, or you're worried or you have anxiety about it, you're not going to be able to open your third eye. You're not going to have that fourth density positive um, compassion in your heart unless the lower ones are cleared or, or they're you're working on clearing them so that the energy from below can come up and meet the energy from above. It's like, Bryce, I'm sure you know a little bit more about this um, with the Kundalini awakening where um, she comes up from the bottom and meets at the top. And it's like, if you are not ready for that, like you can cause yourself a world of. There, okay. Yes. There are books written about this. I'm glad you brought this up because I don't come even on. We're reading the tantric system on my channel right now. I come from the Patanjalin system where Kundalini is not done in an act of sex done on your own in your own practice. Okay. So that's the world I come from. And when you're doing it on your own through a daily practice, it's slow. It's a slow process of healing. Healing is not going to happen overnight. It's, years years but people who've had a kundalini awakening too fast it's not good it sends them into i mean there are books written about one guy went blind like it, it sends them into they call it bliss is blistering like it sends them into this they have it processed you know it's like taking a baby who can't walk and then throwing him on a trip a cross-country track to run Right. You're not ready for it because you haven't gone through the necessary steps to get there. And so slowly is better. And that's the thing. There is no finish line. That's what I really want to express this to people. Guys, when we ascend, we're still going to be working on ourselves. As long as you have a physical body, you're going to be working on yourself. There's no finish line. There's no, oh, you're done. Congratulations. I, what did I say to you, Stephanie? We were together about weight. When I see someone who has added weight, what did I say to you? I see them. At? You said to me that it's, it's not your fat, it's you're hurt and you're in pain and you need to heal. Like there's We're a lot of healing it. that needs to be done. So I was underweight too. Same thing. So I want everybody right now to look down at their belly. Are you overweight? Yep. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. I'm now working on it though. <laughs> now we have something to work as Pastor David Greg, Greg would say, okay, now we have something to work with. Why is your body holding on to weight there? It's not because of your genetics. It's not because of anything else, but an emotion that is clogging those, those energy points. Okay. Now look down at your belly. Are you underweight? Okay. Now we have something to work with because underweight and overweight, same thing. It's both, it's both wounds. That's all it is. Underactive and hyperactive. And Sarah's your body is I'm so underactive. I'm or you would be hyperactive. I'm hyperactive. Yeah. The body is so freaking beautiful, you guys. It's so beautiful because that's its job. It it's speaks job. to you. It, it's telling you all these different things. And it's a matter of when you're doing that shadow work, it's like, okay, so I'm having this pain um, on this side of my body and that connects to this. And it's like, once you start to figure out the interconnectedness of your body and how it truly is trying to signal to you what is wrong. It's not, Oh, I need to go pop a pill. No, it's why, what was the energy that's there and what, where is this stemming from? Right. 
So like, for instance, I've had a left ankle problem. So left being the feminine, I learned this from you, Bryce. Yeah, I got a little bit of mama issues going on. Absolutely. So I have to work through a lot of childhood stuff that stems from, you know, my mother, mothers to plural, uh, long story, one day I'll share, not right now. So I do have a little bit of issues going on there. So, you know what I mean? Um, and that's been a big, big issue. And so it's like my body has been trying to tell me, hey, knock, knock, we got we to gotta, we gotta work on this. And you got to get to the point where you're not afraid to work on it. You just do it, right? And a lot of the same issues are going to keep coming up. It's not, I'll show you guys, I'll use my body as an example. Even though I've been at this almost 16 years now, I still have work to do. It's never ending. I don't know if you guys can see, I'm going to stand up. So my right shoulder kind of slumps down, right? It kind of, it, it slumps lower than my left. My left hip sits higher than my right. My, my left hip is right here. My right hip is right here. All right. And this, so it's a, there's a diagonal issue that's happening here. Okay. This is all energetic. This is all energetic body. Right is masculine. Left hip is feminine. So I have major left hip issues. Yes, my hip is very open. Yes, I can put my leg behind my head. Yes, I can do all that stuff. Doesn't mean there's not issues there. Doesn't mean I don't feel it. When you were here in Connecticut, you had, you were really struggling with that and you weren't even able to, you were in a little bit of a rut. I'm just using this as an example because you've been at this for 15 plus years mm -hmm. and no, the work doesn't end. And you went into that rut because you were starting to have some stuff come up that had not surfaced yet even after 15 years yeah. i wanted to bring that up that example because if someone's telling you oh you've done your work no you haven't so it never ends i mean it's just it, the beginning of it can be quite gruesome because you're just starting out and, and like when i first started to work out doing the bar oh my god i was in tears every single day and i'm not a big crier at all so for me to cry it takes a lot and i was just like waterworks and now I get, now I'm to the point where I might get like that every couple of weeks now, every three weeks or maybe even once a month. Um, so, it, I mean, it doesn't get, I shouldn't say it doesn't get any easier, but the first part of it, I don't know if you went through that, Bryce. Or, oh yeah. Um, I mean, where the beginning of the brunt of it was like, holy crap, like smack in the face full of like. It goes through cycles. Years. It goes yeah, through cycles. It and that's the thing, like you'll go through a period of, of um, ego death where you're crying, your body hurts, and then all of a sudden it'll clear up and your practice is beautiful and you feel great. And then maybe you'll get a new posture or your body will drop deeper and all of a sudden it comes up again because these are deeply held, what we, we call them. So, I mean, you talked about the re repetitiveness. We call that in Sanskrit a samskara. So a samskara is like, um, you know, the old record players. And when you'd have the needle and it would skip, that's a samskara, okay? And so sometimes these samskaras, yes, do cross over multiple lifetimes, but that doesn't mean you go back to that lifetime. You just deal with the issue at hand in this lifetime. And it's like um, we were talking about enlightenment. I was saying before we started filming, Krishnamacharya had a very famous quote where he said, the minute I call myself a yogi, then I am not a yogi, okay? Because a yogi is someone who's enlightened. The minute you call yourself enlightened, you're no longer enlightened, we're practicing yoga. We're students of yoga. We're students of this. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, um, I think ego gets the best of a lot of us and I've been seeing it so much in the spiritual community lately with, um, whoops, people calling, like giving themselves labels and, Oh, I'm enlightened. I'm a star seed from so-and-so, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm awakened. That's all ego. You know, a, a spiritually enlightened person wouldn't need to tell people, you know, hey, I'm a star seed from the Pleiades or, or whatever. It's not necessary. And it's like, as, as soon as you start getting wrapped up in who you are or where you came from or what you were in, in a last life, it's like you were saying earlier, Bryce, it's escapism. It's a distraction. If something is coming up for you that has ties to a past life, that's what needs to be healed right now. Going back into what you were or what you did or, or becoming obsessed or distracted by that other lifetime is pointless. 
it's not going to do anything for you here and now. Anything that comes to mind is just something that need that you carried with you that needs to be healed in, in this lifetime. 100%. I also think too that um, a lot of these fake spiritual people in the community, especially on Telegram and Twitter, have been reaching out to people saying, oh, there's a starseed connection. And so they're feeding off of the fact that you want to find yourself in that we're using these things as escapism. And so what they're doing is they are literally pretty much uh, being very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're very, being very forceful, like, oh, um, you're from this planet, you're this planet, this planet, you're a star seed, you need a healing and everything like that. And um, there was a situation that was brought to my attention the other day. So be very careful. Um, if you're viewing this, you know, if people are coming after you using these tactics to say you are this, you're this, you're this, and they're, they're scanning you without your permission. I, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of this going on. Bryce and I were talking about it the other day. It was a situation I was um, talking to somebody about um, where people are going, these, these fraudulent spiritualists are going after people, telling them they're from this planet, and they're not even getting their consent to even look at their soul or anything like that. And these are people who are fake doing Reiki on people and everything like that. So be very, very mindful to those watching because this is a situation that is going on in the spiritual community. Um, all in all, nobody can do the work for you. Nobody can enlighten you. Nobody can um, heal you. I mean, you can go to a Reiki healer, but I mean, I had Reiki done by you. And the biggest thing that caught my ear when I did Reiki with you is you said something what I say kind of to people when I do my readings is you you're just like I'm the conduit you're the one healing yourself so you have to actually accept the healing but you're healing yourself and that makes you integral as a Reiki practitioner um you know it's, nobody can do it for you nobody can do the work for you you have to make the conscious choice to do it for yourself yeah. you can have people to help guide you through but essentially boils down to the individual yeah. and what they do. And I want to hit on that too, this, and it's, it's like baffling to me how people cannot understand the concept of consent. We've talked about this so much. You guys, you cannot read somebody's energy without their permission. That is a huge no, no. You are spiritually assaulting someone. If you read tarot cards on someone without their consent, if you do a scan of their body without their consent, that is a 100% negative polarity. That is a spiritual assault. Okay. It's assaulting someone. That's not good. It's, and I don't understand why people can't see this. All right. And here's what happens. The funny thing is, the ironic thing is the way spirit works. Um, if you do, let's say, pull tarot cards on someone without their consent, nine times out of 10, you're going to get a false reading. Because spirit will block certain things, okay? If we're looking at trying to figure out who's good, who's bad, in a court of law, tarot cards aren't going to matter. It's going to be evidence. I know certain people are bad because I have evidence, actual evidence, mm -hmm. okay? Well, also, let's go into, I know we're not talking about divination. We're talking about shadow work, but... I know a lot of people have gotten their own packs of tarot cards, their own pendulums. If you're using it for gossip purposes, you're using it wrong and you're going to get false information out of it. It is not to be used for gossip. It is used to be a tool to help and guide um, and to, to confirm. It's, I like to say it's not giving you the answers. The, the divination tools are confirming what you already know, whether it's on a soul subconscious level or whether it's on your conscious level. You know, if you got that download the other day and you want to confirm it with divination tools, you know, Bryce will often say, hey, I got this download. Can you look into this when you get a second? Yes. And if I have the minute, I will go ahead and divinate and everything like that. She gave me her permission and it was a download she had, not a download someone else had. Um, and, and what, you know, you know what I mean? But it's not to be used for gossiping. That is absolutely wrong. Um you know, and when I first started divinating, I didn't know that concept. So now that I know, now I understand that 
there's a, there's a big responsibility with anybody who's a conduit. And I, I'm sure that goes for you, I mean, as being a Reiki practitioner, it's the same exact concept. Mm -hmm. um, having the consent, making sure that you're you, integral, that your intentions are pure and of the light. You know what I mean? Because you can use any of these tools, any of these healings to, it's, you know, we're in, we're in duality, so it could go either way. So you just have to be very, very mindful and take full responsibility and, and make sure that, you know, you're setting your intentions the proper way. I know therapists who won't, they'll tell people like, oh, I'm scared to go out with you because you're a therapist and therapist is like, I'm not therapying you in, in a, in a bar. I'm not like looking at you as a patient because that's wrong. Like when I'm out socializing, I'm just a human. So even therapists will have that, that boundary of, if you're not my patient, then I'm not going to be looking into your actions and what you're doing from that perspective. So even like therapists have that, um, you know, doctors, it's like people who are telling us that these are a placebo that's bullshit because that goes against the, the law of free will. If somebody signed up to get one of these and you give them a placebo, then you just broke, broke the law, law of free will. You have to give them the real one because that's what they asked for. So if the so white bringing that up, I want to, I want to come up with an example here. Okay. I'm going to use myself as an example. And I told you about this the other day, Bryce, when I got diagnosed with fibromyalgia, I got diagnosed by a doctor who was doing a trial on Cymbalta. Okay. Cymbalta is a depression medication, but it's also used for uh, nerve pain from fibromyalgia and um, a terrible drug, by the way, terrible. Yeah, um, terrible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Horrendous. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, at that time I was, I mean, we're talking, this is like literally 15, 16 years ago. Okay. It's probably right after my son was born. So maybe we're talking 15 years. And when I had, I signed up for the trial and one of the parts of that trial was I had to sign the understanding, sign my name that I understood there's a possibility I'm not taking the real medication. I'm taking a placebo. So I had to sign consent understanding that. Yeah. So unless you're signing on a line that says you might not be getting the actual it might be placebo. You're getting the real thing because that's the law of consent. The white hats cannot go and, and, per, and, oh, it's, it's for their own good. That's what the fucking Nazis said too. If someone signs up to get something done and they've given consent, you got to give them the real thing or else you've just broke their law of consent. And what I think is happening is people who got the first one of these and then woke up are now avoiding working on why they were susceptible to getting this in the first place by saying, oh, it's just a placebo. No, you need to sit with yourself and figure out why you fell for it. Why? That's your work. That's your karma. You can't avoid it. I had to do that with, just sit and think to myself, because the thing is, you know, I was, I was told if I didn't get the, I was just going on rumble. I can blurb the words out. It's fine. Okay. I'll just say the, 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 the flu thingy. Okay. Um, at my work, I'd have to put a, something on my face for the whole entire winter time. Part of my, my intuition always knew it was bad and I ended up getting it anyways. Cause I didn't want to work. Sorry. You're going to have to blurp a lot of words out. <laughs> okay. Um, so I had to sit and think to myself, why did I continue to allow people to manipulate me that way? What was, what, what part of me, what I was giving my power over to somebody and manipulating, even though I knew there was something I didn't know and I hadn't researched and I hadn't figured out what exactly that was. I had to sit and start to think, why did I give my power to my employer and continue it? And one year I said, no, and I, I got away with not putting anything on, on my face, but you know, well, and that's what our friend Shanti would say. So where you, when you've allowed someone to manipulate you, where have you manipulated yourself? Mm -hmm. Where have you manipula manipulated yourself? And that, and I just want to express that guys, like, again, with these things, there's no placebo guys. We don't want a government that would lie to us like that. That's not good. Okay. And so if you got the first one and you're awake now, all right, now you have something to work with. Now you have something to work with. Now you have something to go, where did I not listen to myself? Why did I 
allow myself to be duped into this. And then that's where that, as the law of wants is that catalyst that then this thing then becomes your catalyst. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes for those who have fake getting one on a sheet of paper. Cause that's not taking your power back either. That's just my personal opinion. I know so many people that did that falsely so they can get on an airplane or something, mm -hmm. but that's not being true with yourself. No. Yeah. And I, I could never, that's just my personal opinion. People can get mad at me all they want, but I, you're, you're, you're still not holding your power. You're still not calling your power back. When you are allowing an employer, a spouse, a friend, a group of people, um, a, a religion to strip you of your power, that's something to work with. That's something you need to work on. And I, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, we, this is the first three chakras are absolutely the biggest ones to really work with because, you know, those are where this programming and the ego and everything is coming from. So can we, can we go through like what our routines are for doing shadow work to give people some actionable steps that they can take. You know, we keep saying that you need to work through this, but let's tell people exactly what it is that we do to work through this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's start. <clears throat> I'll start. Yeah. You can okay. start. You're the one that came up with the idea. <laughs> okay. Um, That's what your homework is, Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I started, I started my shadow work in recovery programs for addiction and you don't have to start there. There are, are many, but I'm just going to use this as an example. And in the recovery programs I've been in, they've, all of them have encouraged, um, taking an inventory, taking an inventory of all of your fears, all of the resentments that you have, all of the triggers that you have, all of the wrongs that you've done to other people, all the wrongs other people have done to you. Just take an in, take stock, take stock of yourself and don't let that overwhelm you and just start going down the list. And if things come up that are new, add them to the list. And then when you're working through resentments, um, I have a video on my channel on working through resentments. That's the way that I work through it. There's other ways. Just look this stuff up. Look, look up. How do I work through resentment? How do I work through forgiving someone? How do I look past a trigger, look past the person who's triggering me and figure out where this is stemming from and, and what do I do to get there? Um, I mentioned Aaron Abke earlier. He has uh, a series on his channel called Spiritual Intelligence. And in that series, he talks about catalyst and having a catalyst journal. That's another way. If something comes up that bothers you or really triggers you, anything from the smallest irritation to the largest trigger, go through the steps. Uh, there's four steps in the catalyst journal. You basically give a brief description of what the event was. You figure out which of the lower three chakras it's coming from, root, sacral, or solar plexus. And there are certain beliefs of the ego that correspond. His videos explain all of that, very detailed. And then you figure out which of the emotions are stemming either fear, a form of fear, a form of sadness, or a form of anger. And there are, are many variations of those three um, emotions, but those are the three main ones. And then you ask yourself two questions. What is this catalyst asking me to be aware of within myself? And what is this catalyst asking me to accept or forgive within myself? And when you go through this, you'll find that there is the same thing almost repeated. The same thing is triggered and repeated and repeated. Then you have good, accurate information on, okay, I really need work on my sacral chakra. Go find meditations on YouTube for, for sacral chakra. Go find yourself a Reiki practitioner that is not operating out of ego. Nobody else can heal you. If a healer says they're healing you, they're operating out of ego. So be very cautious about that. You know, then you have, you know what to work on. You can do the meditations. You can do the clearings um, yourself. You can do the spiritual hygiene. 
but you have to educate yourself and you have to be willing to do the work and write the things down and, and work through it. And it's not pretty. It's ugly. There's snot and tears and anger and yelling and punching pillows. And this is what shadow work is. It's like getting down in the trenches and doing the work. It's not butterflies and rainbows like bryce said you're not going to watch a reiki video on my channel for activating spiritual gifts and just be all of a sudden healed i have so many views on that video and hardly any on the the videos that actually show you how to do the work there's no free pass guys there's no, no free pass nobody's going to do it for you nobody's going to heal you for you you're not going to listen to one meditation and be like oh you know, you have to be willing to consistently look at yourself and ask yourself those questions like Stephanie was saying. Self-inquiry is so important and being willing to look at yourself objectively and not attach or judge. Mm -hmm. We attach to everything, everything. And if you can look at your stuff without attaching to it, like, like it's a red ball on the floor. You know, there's no emotional attachment to a red ball on the floor. If you can look at your behavior and the things that you do, the things that you say, the things that you think, like it's a red ball on the floor and, oh, okay, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why do I feel this way? Um, and, and write it down. And for me, it helps to simultaneously self-educate. Like I'm studying... Um, a Course in Miracles, and the Law of One, and Yoga Philosophy all at the same time. I love, love that book. Love what it. What book is that? Course in Miracles. This book has come in and out of my life since I was 20 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I do. I'm a big fan of 12-step recovery. I know that that doesn't work for everyone. And there are a lot of recovery programs out there for addictions. Um, and, you know, don't be ashamed. I was addicted to cigarettes. I was addicted to alcohol. I was addicted to opiates. I was addicted to food. Okay. And those things can be worked through yeah. um, and healed from. That's where, that's where the juicy. And I love what you said, because in the yoga sutras, they talk about being the watcher. So Parusha is the watcher where property is the watchable. And uh, Ram Das, who is one of my favorite teachers, bar none across the world. Um, a lot of his books, I've talked a lot about his books. They've been very meaningful for me. His commentary in the Bhagavad Gita is one of my favorite. As you can see, my book's kind of falling apart. I've read it so many times, but he talks about that when you're able to observe yourself and your behavior and just be like, and can, it would just watch it for what it is because it's that judgment when we know we've done something wrong and we're filled with shame then mm -hmm. we won't heal but when we're able to look at it for what it is and say interesting i reacted that way why did i react this way and just see it for what it is then we come into a place called guilt which isn't shame because guilt is recognizing a behavior that's bad but knowing you yourself aren't bad Whereas shame shames everything. And I want to, I want to specify too something really important. I think people are, we have this idea in our society of a sin of something being bad. And so we hide ourselves from that in order to have self-acceptance. No human being is perfect. And these mistakes that we make in life are what make us who we are when we, we can work through them. When we can take, I love people who have had really fucked up lives. The ones that have gone through stuff, they've done bad things and they've come out the other side. Those are my favorite people because they're, they're wise, they're empathetic, they have compassion, they understand, they see the world differently than people who do something bad, run from it, blame someone else in projection and never heal, okay? So I want any time in your life where you fucked up, whether that was you have a propensity to cheat on your spouse, whether that's you have the propensity to overeat or you're addicted to alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, or maybe Maybe you're addicted to gossip. That's an addiction too. And like we see, there's a lot of tarot card channels out there in the truth or community that are literally just gossip channels. They're doing nothing to help your, you spiritually grow. Knowing whether or not Bill Gates was born with a penis or not does nothing for your spiritual enlightenment. 
Okay. So what are, if that, if you, and yeah, I love my reality t- TV. I'll raise my hand up. I'll watch the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Like I'll watch that shit, but I know it's, I know what it is. And I'm not avoiding my work at the same time. I'm not using it as a way, ooh, look at how bad that person is. So now I don't have to look at myself, right? First of all, we don't know if Bill Gates was born a male or a female because the tarot cards are never going to tell you that. They're never going to give you that because Bill Gates has not given us his permission to read that, okay? All right. Now, my routine. Now, again, I've been doing this for almost 16 years. And I am heavily actually... Marnie Alton said this one day in a class and I thought it was great. You only start to wake up when you actually get into your body. So I, of course, my biggest, 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 biggest tool for self-work is always going to be exercise, but purposeful exercise. So if you're doing an exercise that's helping you to escape something, then that's not what I'm talking about. All right. If you're playing outside with your kids, yes, that's fun. Do that. They need that. But if you're counting that as your exercise, then you're escaping something because you're distracted, right? You need something like bar or yoga or Pilates or uh, Taekwondo or running something that's going to pull you into your body. And it's going to force you or box. It's going to force you to be in your body. Okay. We have different with the yoga. One thing that makes the yoga kind of stand out because the yoga is actually designed for shadow work. That's what it, that's what it's designed is for the poses that is. So the asana, so asana means a posture or a seat for meditation. So we have these different channels of energy in our body. As we were talking about with the chakras, they also come through your nostrils that we interweave as well. One is feminine, one is masculine. Um, and when we're able to put ourselves in these different shapes, we start to open up these different values, right? And that's that's why the yoga practice is so powerful because, again, that was what it was specifically designed for, was to force these, these, these channels of energy to open. And, yes, I most of my 16 years in this practice has been snot coming out of my nose, puffy eyes from crying, um, aches and pains that I ne- didn't even know existed because sometimes aches and pains aren't just soreness. They're actual energy breaking up. Um, I've gone through a shit ton of therapy. Um, I've had a great trauma therapist. Um, I've gone through amazing teachers. I've been incredibly blessed when it comes to my journey. God really blessed me in this department. I've always been given really good integral teachers. And when you're looking for a teacher, if there's a teacher that's walking around with their chest puffed out, like they're so great, that's not the teacher for you. You need a teacher that's going to be very, very focused on you and using their knowledge to help guide you, but not do the work for you, right? We don't want a teacher that's going to be reading you sweet poetry after class. That's bullshit. My teachers yell at me. My teachers get very tough with me and I get tough with my students because this is tough love. I can vouch for that. I turn into a different person as a teacher because that's my You're job. You're very, you have your boundaries because you don't want to break that boundary. Yeah. So when you did yoga with me that one day, I did think I was going to die that day. I, I got through it though. Uh, <laughs> I, no almost died yet. I almost cried. I almost punched Bryce. <laughs> I have punched a teacher before. I punched um, a teacher coming in back. But yeah, back. you're, you're, you're tough. You're not like, it's not bitch though. It's, you're just tough. And you know, like, not to try to be like coddle yourself in the middle of a practice with Bryce being your teacher, because she's not going to allow you to do it, which I appreciate because we kind of need that sometimes we need a kick in the ass. We do. We need kick in the ass. Well, and you're not, I'm not there to feel sorry for you. Yeah. You know, this is the thing. We all have trauma. We all have issues we've been through. And that's why you're coming into the yoga room or that's why you're doing whatever it is, your whatever modality you're using is because you're trying to deal with that trauma. But dealing with a trauma doesn't mean you're going to run from it and be coddled from it. It means you have to actually work through it. You have to actually, now with that being said, as, as a, that's one thing you need to look for too with teachers. What's their resume? Where do they get their training from? Same with Reiki people. Where do they get their training from? If you're looking for a yoga teacher and the, the, the thing just says they went through some training course, don't go to that teacher. That's my advice. That's my opinion. Don't go to that teacher. If the teacher has a lineage they're a part of and they have an actual teacher listed on their resume that they are accountable to, there you go. There's your teacher because they are accountable to someone as well. And they've had the training themselves and they do the same thing that you're doing. I can't teach somebody. I can't pull someone's leg behind their head. Until unless I've had my leg pulled by my, behind my head multiple times before, because I know the sensations that are coming up. I know the emotions that are coming up. I understand what's going to be happening to that student. So I can be there to help keep that on track. Does that make sense? So that's super, super, super important. 
um, when you're looking for that type of, uh, and there's like, I think Marnie Alton is a superb bar teacher because she obviously is very well educated in the energetic responses as well. Mm -hmm. She's my recommendation for bar. I think she's superb. She knows a lot about the energetic body. She knows a lot about what's going on emotionally in the, in the, in the, in her, her workouts. So you're getting, you're meeting that same type of information journal. I have actually, Jesse's a boater kind of started me on this. I have my own forgiveness journal. I uh, write letters to God. I write letters to God in this journal. And I ask for, uh, if I, if people I need to forgive, I explain like what they did to hurt me. I've been, everybody knows this last month, I've been extremely betrayed. I haven't had an income in nine months because, because of a betrayal. And it still, and instead of actually fixing it privately as I wanted to, all of a sudden there was a smear campaign against me because I dared to try to fix it. Right. So I have a lot of forgiveness that I need to do from that betrayal. Yeah. And that's in this journal right here. And then I also put those people in a place of praying for them and, and, how, and allowing God to heal them, you know, and not crossing consent and boundaries. They have to do that work themselves, but so that I feel better so that I can be at peace so that I can work through that, you know? Um, and so that's, that's one of my things right here. I'm not going to open it because I don't want anything to be read that's written in here, but, um, by, by wondering eyes, but I don't care if Emmy and Stephanie see it, but you know, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and also constantly having, I mean, I can I have people in my life that are senior to me and the practices of Ashtanga that I'm constantly talking to through with, through things And I'm constantly, I am a huge, obviously a huge fan of research. All of these books on my bookshelf, I've read multiple times. And I continue to pick them up and re-remind. I read the yoga sutras once a year. Every year, I reread them. My yoga sutra book is completely all, where is it? It's in here. Like, it's completely, you can tell that I've read this so many times. I mean, the bind, it's, it's totally so many times. And every time I reread it, I, I remember something I forgot, or I read something a little bit differently because of the work I've done. And, um, and yeah, and then, um, and then just making sure that you're catching yourself too. So the ego, we're never going to be without our ego ever. All right. And that's the point of, of, of shadow work and yoga is, is understanding the, the dance between the Shiva Shakti, understanding the dance between Prakriti and Purusha. So you're not allowing when you're in the practice, you're not allowing your ego to dictate who you are, but you're allowing the ego to have its proper place because the ego is where the fight or flight response is going to come from. The ego is where um, the need to want to feed your children is going to come from. So making sure the ego has its proper place, right? Um, so you're always going to have that, that ego there. I forgot where I was going with this, but anyway, um, <laughs> so, so in that work, you're having to find the proper placement for these, these, um, energies that you carry in this lifetime. Right. And, and as we, I, again, I wanted to really emphasize with you guys, as we ascend, there's no race. Like you can't, you can't get to a certain level of ascent of, of, of understanding and ascension in order to go to fourth density positive. If you're harvesting to fourth density positive, you are already going to harvest before you took this life anyway. And when we flip into fourth density positive, these mommy issues, these daddy issues, these betrayal issues, these abandonment issues, these addictions, they're still going to be there. They're still going to be there. It's never ending. So take a deep breath work on yourself and with, oh, with the ego too. So when the ego gets out of hand is when that artful dodger starts to come around. So that's what David Green would call it. The artful dodger where we think, oh, you know, I don't need to practice today because you know, my big toe hurts a little bit mm -hmm. or we avoid the work where we, instead of actually sitting in meditation or exercising or journaling, we watch those gossip tarot card channels again and say, this is me contributing to the great awakening. So we have to start catching ourselves. There's a time and a place for entertainment. There's a time and a place for all that stuff. If you're practicing yoga, are you turning music on while you're practicing yoga? Because that's a no-no. No music when you're practicing yoga. You need to be alone with your thoughts. You don't need anything to distract you or, or to entice a sensation that's not naturally going to be there for you to, for you to examine. You can go. I love my music. Go listen. Before I practice every morning, I have a full on Broadway tap fest in the living room in my pajamas. Like I got it. Still yet. I'm going to pay to see that one day. I just want to fly on the wall. I love Thoroughly Modern Million. That's my favorite right now. I'll listen and I'll dance around before I get on. My, then I put it down and I get on my mat. Right. So I love There's a time and a place for this stuff. 
But if you're really serious, and then after you're done with your practice, while you're in your practice and these emotions come up, as Emmy said, you're in, you know, you're in a deep back bend or you're in a forward fold or whatever it is. And all of a sudden you feel this like surge of energy come up or this anger release or tears or laughter. Observe it. Oh, that's interesting. And then when you're done practicing, maybe journal about it. Hey, when I was in Paschimottanasana today, I started laughing. Huh. Why? Now you become your own scientist too. You start to explore yourself. And that's that dissension into who you are as a person, who you are, not who you were in the past. So, and in doing this work, guys, even in the, I've said this before, David Garig would get, if you don't know about the practice of Ashtanga, it's the type of yoga I practice is probably one of the most extreme versions of yoga. We're talking, um, le- I mean, it is crazy. The asanas that we have to do, that we have to train ourselves to do. Um, and, you know, with David Garig in the Meister room, like young girls would be in there who had been cheerleaders or gymnasts and they, you know, their bodies were already pretty able. And he was like, whatever, next foster, whatever. But when like a 60 year old man would come in who was overweight and couldn't touch his toes, David got so excited. Now we have something to work with. Finally, now we got shit to work with. Because where your weaknesses are, where the extra weight is being held, where the tightness is, where that energy is stuck, that's where it's juicy. That's where it's juicy. That's where you're going to, when you start to crack that open and allow whatever it is to come out, that's where you start to learn about who you are, who you really are. And that's when things start to change. And sometimes that changes that friction that needed to light that match. Sometimes that friction is very uncomfortable. And not fun. And sometimes you're you're spending. I know women who were that I practice with who would be sitting in their the pickup line at school just sobbing because of going through that dark night of the soul. But you got to let it happen. You got to let it out, right? It's it's a it's 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 as cheesy as it sounds. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. And even in the Bhagavad Gita, which is my favorite freaking book, it was the most life changing book I've ever read. Krishna tells Arjuna. To love the work for the sake of the work, not for the fruits of your labor. Mm-hmm. So you're in, and that is so huge. So when you're in that really uncomfortable asana, or you're having that dark night of soul, to be in that moment and to love it, even though it hurts and it's painful, to be there with it because you love the work, not because of the light at the end of the tunnel but because we're here now. Think about what we're going through globally right now. Everyone's like, oh, I can't, I'm guilty of saying that. I can't wait till this happens. I can't wait till that happens. I can't wait. But what is, maybe it hasn't happened yet because we're not settling into right now. Hmm. Maybe it's collective what you wish for because it's not exactly going to be butterflies, rainbows, and unicorns. So many people putting out there that the ascension is happening right now. I mean, it's going to be a very slow rollout of the ascension. It doesn't happen just like, like, like that. It's, there's a, there's a slowness to it or else we'd all just die. We couldn't we handle go. it. There would be, and there would be no, and this is the one time I want to, I want to re. this comes back to the law of one too. This is the one time historically we're in a great big science experiment right now with the cause yeah, pretty much so you guys know, this is the one time historically where human beings have been able to ascend within their living body without having to go through death first. Okay. So it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a slow experience. And maybe if we all just settled into being here today, we're filming on Thursday. This is Thursday, September 15th. Okay. I'm going to settle into being here on Thursday, September 15th and deal with what I'm dealing with today. I'm not going to think about what's going to happen next week. I know. I actually do know when certain arrests are going to happen. I'll just admit that I do know when certain arrests are going to happen. I'm not going to say anything though, but I'm going to settle with right here, right now, where I am as me, as Bryce. One thing that happens um, that, that you'll notice as you, as you do your shadow work, what you were saying, we're ascending with our physical body. So in order for us to ascend, we have to fully descend into this physical body. And the only way to do that is to get rid of the shit that's in the way. If you have trauma, triggers, resentments, all this stuff to work through, if it's not worked through, your soul cannot come into your body all the way. You're stuck up here in the upper chakras. And if you're only developing your third eye or your crown or your throat chakra, and you're not doing any of the hard stuff down here, you're only going to stay up here. You're not going to fully descend into your body. And then until you fully descend into your body, 
can you start the ascension process? It's like, it's a beautiful marrying of the physical and the spiritual. It's like a, a, a coming up from the bottom and a coming down from the top and you're meeting in the middle in the heart space. And it's just, it, it's such a miraculous transformation when you're going through it and you can start to notice these things as as big, huge revelations are discovered within yourself and, and major things are healed from and cleared out of the way, I notice a lot of the time that I feel incredibly heavy, not in a bad way, but in almost like my soul is connecting with the minerals in my body. And I just feel, I feel the density of it. And it's like, it feels good, kind of like a massage, but it takes a minute to integrate as you as you're descending down into your body. It it takes a while to integrate that and to connect with that, but you can feel it. Like yeah. you can feel it, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful process. That's that autonomy, and that that's what happens. Um, I, as a teacher, I see this, and I remember this when I first started practicing. So many people don't know what it's like to be in their body. They mm-hmm. think they're in their body, but they, they, and the yoga sutras talk about this as well. You know, that's why we use the physical body first, because you can, you feel the soreness in your biceps and your quadriceps. But then when you start to notice the subtle responses, that's when you know your soul is descending in because it's noticing things about your structure that you didn't notice before more things are arising and that autonomy starts to happen. You start to descend into who you actually are. So many people and I mean, how many women get freaking, what's it? They get um, injections into their feet so they can wear stiletto shoes. They don't feel the nerve endings. You know, that was big in LA. Like how many people avoid the sensation of their body? I never even heard of that. (laughs) Me either. I lived in LA for a very long time. You apparently people will do. That's that's some dedication. That's some dedication. (laughs) But they're avoiding. And how many people avoid that sensation? They avoid everything. Yeah. I mean, uh, Stephanie is in a unique position because she came from the exact opposite world and then transferred into this world. It's kind of helped me though. I mean, I don't know if you want me to touch a, a kind of upon my little routine yeah, that please. I yeah. do. Tell us so I was blessed having Bryce as a friend <laughs> because yeah, you are a professional in this and you've helped me figure out, I would have not really known. I'm kind of in this like so what I, what I do is probably for the most part about five times a week I do um, early morning exercise um, and sometimes yeah I do have that feeling like the ego comes in that oh you're too tired oh you should just take a day off I'm still facing that but for the most part I do about five days a week and I balance out between a bar workout and the beginning practice of the Ashtanga yoga. I've started to incorporate that now, building into the bar. So I'll start off with some stretches, do the bar, um, you know, a half an hour to 45 minute workout with that. And then I do the first 20 minutes of Ashtanga, the prime for the primary series. Is that what you call it, Bryce? So like I have this love for the sun salutations because it makes me feel so awake and alive. <laughs> and, and it's it's not easy when you first start to do it because you're really starting to it's interesting because throughout my workout which I think is the best way to do shadow work for my for myself um, personally kind of like you Bryce is I'm starting to recognize like for instance when I was doing the yoga I'm starting to notice the bottom of my feet hurt like freaking crazy and I had to start to figure out what on earth like and work through that and not avoid it but to continue working through it there are certain burning sensations I'll get during um bar when you're doing the pelvic tucks I find myself having to pee in the middle of the dang workout and saying no that's just my body's avoidance to do it because I have stagnant energy there um a lot of times if I'm doing certain bar techniques or I'm doing certain movements in the bar workout where I'll start to cry. And then there was one day I like literally got super, super angry. And the anger was coming from the fact that I was working my inner thighs a lot in the, in the middle of the workout. So there's different parts of your body where different energies are going and you start to recognize that. And you start to recognize how your body is, what different energies you're feeling, the different sensations and really digging into that. 
Now this morning I was super proud of myself, like super proud of myself because normally I like to avoid the burning sensations within like my calves and everything. Although I have very muscular legs. I always have. My legs are not a big issue. It's, it's um, my arms. Okay. They get floppy as Bryce saw during my workouts when she was here, which I've activated, you know, trying to activate my arms a little bit more, engage them a lot more because I was avoiding it, but it was not avoiding it on a conscious level. You'll start to avoid things on a subconscious level. So you have to start to recognize that. And that, today I, why a teacher is important. Exactly. Yeah. And I wouldn't have recognized it if you hadn't said anything. So that was the fabulous thing about you. One of the fabulous things about you being up here for a visit, but I oftentimes will like, if the burning gets too much, I'll like take a breather for a second. And this morning, no, I actually dug into it. Like I literally dug into it. <laughs> it's juicy when you bite into it. It was so freaking hard. But I kept getting that. Like my soul was trying to say, Stephanie, it freaking hurts like hell. But I need you to get through this. Like your my higher self was connecting with me and saying, no, 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 no. Don't you dare. Mm -mm. Don't you dare, girl. You work through it. You work through it. So I worked through it and I dug even deeper and I actually did my, the, the, the bend and everything even lower than I normally did. And I really like went, I dove right into the workout this morning. And I, now I feel like I really like did a lot of inner work doing that because that's stuff I normally avoid. I don't like that burning sensation. But I did um, dig deep into that. Sometimes I also, um, I need to get more into this, but I often would journal. I've done on and off journaling my whole life, but writing, I do the whole thing that you do, Bryce, like writing letters to God and everything. Another thing I've been doing a lot lately is recognizing when my ego is coming out or recognizing when I might feel a little bit of an emotion that is triggered by ego. Yeah. Whether it be jealousy, whether it be um, a blaming somebody else for, no, I have myself to blame, you know, and I need to work through that. So I'm, I'm trying to like stop myself and I, I'm starting to recognize more and more these different things that come up to the surface and say, well, why do I feel that way? And I have to, I question myself a lot now. Why am I feeling this way? Where is this stemming from? Where's the root that this is coming from? You know what I mean? And trying to channel through that and trying to sit with myself. I take a lot of alone time and I have to, because if I don't have alone time, I get overstimulated and I actually will get like really like quick to just feel very, very overwhelmed. So I do take a lot of alone time. I'll go outside out in nature and try to like listen to my thoughts and how I feel about things. But the working out part, the physical workouts in my, in the morning, are like the biggest part of my shadow work. Yeah. And well, I, can you touch on that? Cause a lot of people think grounding, they just go put their feet in the grass and that's it. No, it's more. That's than that. great to do that, but that should be done as extra on top of. Yeah. Nothing's gonna ground this question you came up in my class last night. This question came up in my class and I said that, you know, that will help you with your electromagnetic connection with the earth. But that's not doing shadow work. No. Mm -hmm. Shadow work's really going to pull you in. And I want to talk too about what, what was happening with your arms so people kind of understand. And this is why you need a teacher because the teachers are going to see your blind spots. So what was happening was Stephanie was working, but she there was no control in her arms. And so what that tells me as a teacher is that she's not activating the fascia and the muscle within the uh, fourth chakra her heart chakra. And so I had to work with her on actually. So even like, like right now I've got control. You can see the muscles on my muscles are activated. So right now I have control in my arms. There's an at a conscious control over the movement in my arm, whether that's doing yoga or lifting weights or dancing. There's a, you see dancers, they have an active control with their arms, but when there's no control, it's just flying matter. That's all it is. And so that told me that something was going on. And it's so funny because that day she said she had ha having some trouble breathing. You were having some issues. And, and, and I, I have exercise stuff. induced asthma, which I've had as well. But then you go, okay, what's that? That's this. 
So once I saw that and we started to work with your arms, actually getting your arms to activate because the hands and the, the chakras and the hands are an extension of that fourth chakra. So you're actually getting, and you can see if you watch Marty Alton, she's got a lot of control in her arms, right? So that's just ways to kind of, if you're at home doing this to see like, am I just flopping around with no- And I carry control? a lot of my weight in my arms. So the lower three chakras is where I gain my weight, but I also have had an issue with my upper arms which is telling my body, telling me that there is an issue there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anywhere you have extra weight gain or any, any place that you have uh, where if you are like me, like I have the opposite when I get imbalanced, I'll get really skinny, um, real skinny sometimes. And I'm not talking about, yes, I went through some spell casting where I couldn't literally open my mouth, but like, no, putting that aside, like if it's just a regular stressful situation, I will stop eating. Okay. And I will so overeat. So that's something I, two different issues. Hyperactive and underactive issues going on right there. I have had issues with my period. Um, Cause I sometimes will over exercise and I will lose my period. I haven't had that happen in about 10 years because the last time it happened, I actually immediately recognized what was happening and I stopped it. So I got my period back. Um, which is an indicated vacation for, cause I'm not of the age yet to go through menopause. So, um, so for women, that's an indication. If you are over exercising and you've lost your period, why are you over? What are you, what is exercise now become an escapism, right? I was and just about to say, let's talk about that for a second, using exercise as escapism rather than shadow work, because I've noticed this, there are certain people that will hyper do it. Because that's their escapism from the rest of, it's almost like using meditation as an escapism. That's another one. You should not be meditating for over 15 minutes, guys. I get this question a lot from people. Anything over 15 minutes, you're getting into derangement. And what's, and what's meditation really? It's the one point focus, right? Because oh, I, I think a lot of people think it's the manifesting of, of, of whatever. Yeah. Creating about, one yeah. life. Creating like wealth, creating stuff outside of you for your own entertainment is not a form of spirituality, guys. That's spirituality. So your meditation, you're not envisioning your future. You're not envisioning doing things. You're literally bringing yourself to a one-pointed meditation, that yoga to Divratina Rodaha. You're coming into that one-pointed meditation. So that's why mantra meditation is a big form of meditation. So like I had Stephanie start with just chanting Aum over again. That's the starting point. Aum is, and you just chant um, 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 and it gives your mind a one point of focus. And I only have you do it for five minutes. That's all it takes five minutes. Right. Cause we want wanna... five minutes is tough for someone like me. Cause I'm just like, oh, oh, what did I eat for breakfast? What do I want for breakfast? <laughs> like that I do have a hard meditation. time with it. So that it happens in meditation where you see your mind starting to drift off to breakfast while you're, then you bring, you go, okay, I acknowledge my mind's driven. I'm just yep. going to acknowledge it. And now we're going to come right back to Om. We're going to come right back to our Om Navah Shivaya. That's a big mantra. Om Navah Shivaya, Om Navah Shivaya, Om Navah Shivaya, Om Navah Shivaya. You know, there's Om Gom Ganapati Nama. That's the Ganesha channel. Om Gom Ganapati Nama. There's all these different mantras that you can learn and sit. Sit up straight as best you can. Back against the wall so that spine is straight. The muscles are engaged. If your if your body is balanced physically, you should it should not be uncomfortable. So if you do feel a little bit of an uncomfortableness, okay, now you know what you need to work on in your physical practice, right? Um, so and sit against the wall. Be be with that mantra. You can set your phone. I would set the alarm to go off, not with the crazy wah 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 song, but like a nice peaceful when the five minutes is up and that's it. And then you go about your day, right? It brings the mind down into that one pointed focus. Yeah. Another thing too to consider when you're doing shadow work is to simultaneously do spiritual hygiene. Because as you're clearing yourself out and healing these traumas, it's, it's open space and it's new. And if you're not protecting yourself or doing spiritual hygiene, shielding, um, cleansing your aura, filling holes in. If you're not doing that simultaneously, that leaves a vulnerability in your in that area for things to attach that yeah. are not for your highest good. Um, but that's probably going to have to be in another video because we're yeah. we're like we're an hour and a half. Hour. I think this is amazing. Yeah, we'll do another video, guys, soon. Um, I'm not. I don't have my uh, 
comments uh, uh, on right now, but if you, and I don't check Rumble ever comment. So um, if you have any more questions regarding this, you can send me an email um, at esotericatlanta at gmail.com. If there's something you want us to cover, I will say right now, I'm going to, I mean, I, people might say this is ego. I am a, pro this is my professional job. Like outside of YouTube, this is what I've done for years. Okay. I know Emmy as well. This is what she does professionally. Like we, you know, um, Stephanie's professional tarot card reader. Like this is what we do as a profession. Okay. So this is something that, and, and the yoga course is going forward. We're going to wait till after Mercury retrograde for Emmy and me to put that course up just because it's really crazy right now. Um, and I but, have five more spots left in my tarot course, which starts on the 29th. Amazing. If anybody, um, I, you have that link, right, Bryce? Yeah, I'll put so, it on the description box below. And let me make it very clear. This is for people who are very, very animate about using the cards to help others, like to, to really go into it like, like I do, not just for fun, okay? It is a very intense, very intense course. It's, it's accelerated. It's over a span of four weeks, two hours per week. And um, like I said, I have five. I think I have four or five spots left on that one. Well, I'll put that down below. And once we have the new dates organized for Emmy and my course, I'll put that up as well. Um, but I just want to let you guys know, like, we are professionals. This is what I do. This is what I've done for years outside of, you, you, uh, of YouTube. I'm the only female in the state of Georgia authorized to teach this. So I, I hope that you guys will hear what we're saying and take it very seriously because everything we're saying is coming from years of our own experience and years of our own research. Okay. I didn't learn Sanskrit for nothing. You know, this is something. So please take what we're saying very seriously because this is, this is mm -hmm. take it in, do your own work. We're trying to share this information with you because I know for me, that would be bad karma for me not to call out bad behavior when I see it, because that's my job is to, to teach this. And so seeing people doing it, scamming people, I, ha I am obligated to say something because I know what the true teachings are. So I hope that didn't sound arrogant, but that's just, that's just how it is. Okay. So anyway, guys, any last words, ladies? No, thank you very much. No. This is awesome. Yeah, this was fun. And, uh, I think this will definitely help a lot of people. Cause I get this question all the time when I'm doing my readings too. So, and I've been saying, we're going to do another video soon. <laughs> so. Just in some waterproof mascara ladies. Yeah. <laughs> and this is three, it's three different perspectives too. You know what I mean? Like, um, and yeah, I've only been doing the readings for, I think I'm going almost a year as of December, it will be a year. And I came out of the Christian community. So, I mean, this, this is even new to me. This is very new to me. And I think the Christian perspective when we get into spiritual hygiene next is going to be very important because we're, I want to talk about how that's kind of fucked our head up a little bit when it comes to like. This yeah. I mean, we talk about like that, getting all that programming out and everything like that. Cause I mean, don't think it hasn't been a struggle for me because I'm going from one belief system to a completely different yet liberating belief system. Cause trust me, it's, it's, much more liberating on this end of things but but it doesn't take my belief away from god or anything like that it's actually strengthen it and doing the shadow work has definitely strengthened my faith and and helped me even have a closer relationship to god because when you're working out boy that's the closest to god you're gonna get when you you're know, the screaming. are all about god that's why you do the work yeah. is to be closer to god yeah. the whole point so that you're aligned with god right? That's, uh, that's, that's, that's what it's all about. So, all right, guys, well, we'll let you go. Thanks for sitting through this. <laughs> and uh, again, email me if you have any questions and we will cover it uh, next time. So, all right, guys, we love you and we'll happy crying, happy tears. Get ready to get in that mud and just know that this, now we have something to work with. Bite into it. It's juicy. It's yours. It's your shit and it's juicy and it's good. And that's how you're going to learn about yourself. So happy, happy, happy when shadow work becomes a food. <laughs> Happy Friday. It's like a freaking McDonald's commercial. Juicy and good. Yeah. <laughs> your life, you don't need you won't need the the reality TV because you'll realize your own life is a telenovela. So it's fine. It's all good. All right. So all right, guys, we love you and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.